So welcome everyone to set 873. Uh, I've already done that in, in little introduction there, so I won't repeat myself. Uh, let's take a look at the syllabus. Um, so my office is in Harden Hall, room 342D. First of all, is this big enough for everyone to see? Okay. Uh, if you're not familiar with Harden Hall, uh, here's an old map when it used to be called Harden Center. Uh, it's at 33rd and Holdridge. Uh, my office is right here in the north uh, east corner of the building. I'm kind of tucked away. Um, uh, this is the, um, the north wing of the building. So uh, right about here where you see my mouse, that's where the big tower is in the building. We're in the three-story north wing. Um, there's typically some free parking right out here that you can park at. Um, just don't park there all day. Uh, but there's also some student parking here as well. This is behind the, um, uh, the fire station. Okay, so my office hour simply will be the hour after our class, but please feel free to make an appointment with me as well. Uh, the web portal to all my uh, teaching and research is at least easy for me to remember, chrisbiller.com. Uh, there's my email address, builder at unl.edu, and we will have a separate course website uh, for our course. I won't really use um, Blackboard too much, um, uh, just a little bit for a few things, and you'll see that. So if you go to chrisbiller.com, uh, this is actually chrisbiller.com's a forwarding web page to a web server here, and you can click on set 873 and get to the website. Okay. So hopefully all of you went to the bookstore and uh, went to check out what book we're using. I'm sure all of you were disappointed when you saw that there were no books listed. Uh, let me tell you a little bit of a story about what happened. I did not know that I was going to teach this course until mid to late March. And um, uh, at that time, there was only about one week uh, prior to when the bookstore needed to know what book I was using. So once I found out I was going to teach the course, I I went back to uh, uh, the last time I had taught the course, which was in 2005. Obviously, it's been a while. Um, and I looked to find the book that I had used. Well, guess what? It's out of print. So that meant I had one week to then figure out what book am I going to use. Um, and that's not really a sufficient amount of time. Uh, you know, I spent some time, you know, looking at a, a, a a variety of books that I could because obviously there wasn't enough time to get me a valuation copy, at least a paper copy. And so what I ended up doing was saying, well, I've taught this course enough that I, I know what will be uh, good topics to teach, so I'm going to try to teach it without a book this semester uh, and save each of you $100 or so. Uh, if you want, donations are accepted uh, for the money that you're saving and donate to um, We can buy pizza. Anyway, uh, so what I did uh, was that I um, uh, came up with some suggested readings. The book that I have been using was one by Dallas Johnson. He was actually a professor of mine at K-State. Uh, and he actually he had a, a great book. It was one of my most favorite books to use in teaching. Uh, but now, he, at least I talked to him a few weeks ago. He says it's not out of print, but if you go to Amazon.com, if you go to the publisher's website, it sure does look like it's out of print. And that's the book that I was using. Uh, the strength of this book, and what was, uh, I guess, to some respect, revolutionary at the time, was that he really integrated uh, not just uh, the methods that were important for a multivariate course, but also how you can get it done using statistical software packages. That's common, common nowadays for books, but back then it was not. Um, the software package, though, that he used was SAS, and obviously things have changed since 1998 since he published that book. No longer is SAS the dominant software package that it once, once was amongst users. Um, and so since I'm going to be using R in this class, that also made it more difficult to use the book, too. So in my searches for books, I came up with two other ones that I think will be helpful to you. Uh, the first one, this Everett in Hawthorne, um, is a Springer book, and one of the nice things about Springer books, if you haven't uh, noticed this already, is that newer Springer books are often available for free from our library in terms of you can download PDFs of the book. So in, in particular this book, you can go, you know, log on from your computer, 
actually, there's the actual uh, web address, and you can actually get the PDF of the book and download it to your computer for free. So that's really nice. And at first when I saw this book, I thought, hey, that, this looks like a, a good book that I could use for this course. The one problem is that it doesn't include uh, an important topic that's typically used or talked about in a multivariate course. Um, you know, usually about a quarter of the time, maybe one third of the time, this topic's always talked about in a multivariate course. This book does not uh, include it. They give reasons why they don't and they make sense, but still, I think they, sh they should have included it. Uh, then the, uh, the Paul uh, Houston book uh, uh, is also one that's available for free. It's not actually published by a publisher. He just kind of put it up on his website. Um, it hasn't been really updated since 2009, but it still seems like it looks like it's um, uh, pretty decent. And by the way, this author is the statistician Paul, I guess, Houston, not the uh, lead singer from U2, who also has the exact same name. His real name, that is. Um, so the prerequisites for this course, STAT 801, which basically says that um, you uh, need to have an introductory STAT course at the graduate level. I talked about like hypothesis testing, um, like hypothesis testing for a mean, uh, hypothesis testing for variances, but also gets into simple linear regression, uh, talks about a completely randomized design in terms of ANOVA, a randomized complete block design in terms of ANOVA, stuff like that. So that's the, the very basic prerequisite. prerequisite. Uh, this is what's on the books. However, pretty much any other, well, at least a, any other university that has a department of statistics that offers a multivariate course that I have seen also has some additional prerequisites. And I do strongly recommend them. Obviously, I can't totally require you to have them, but I do strongly recommend them. In particular, typically they have regression modeling. So this would be like, for example, STAT 870 in our uh, department here, our STAT department. And, but the reason why they, uh, other universities typically have that as a prerequisite is for this part right here, matrix algebra. You cannot do multivariate methods, or at least have an understanding of them beyond clicking on certain things in a statistical software package. You cannot do these multivariate methods without knowing what matrix algebra is, knowing how to find an inverse of matrix, how to multiply matrices, uh, finding a determinative matrix. You need to know that. Okay. Again, though, that's not a prerequisite for this course. So, and I'll talk about this more later. What I've done is actually written up a whole day lecture on matrix algebra for those of you who maybe are a little bit concerned about your background in that area. We'll talk about that more shortly. Okay, grades for the course. Uh, we will have three tests, a final exam, and we're going to have a number of projects throughout the semester. And these projects and also quizzes will all be put together to be worth 25% of your grade. So the first test, and you'll see why it's only worth 5% of your grade. First test is going to be 5% of your grade. Uh, second test, 25%. Third test, 25%. And this is going to be a comprehensive exam, comprehensive final exam, which is worth 20%. The grading scales, your standard grading scales that you would see, I do assign plus or minus uh, letter grades to. And they are, are figured by 2.5% from those cutoff points for letter grades. Um, uh, again, there's going to be a number of projects that you're going to need to do this semester that's going to involve a lot of computer work, a lot of write-up. Um, and uh, all these projects, you're required to turn them into me electronically uh, in Word documents. The reason being is because it will make it easy for me to grade. I have a tablet PC that I use to grade everything. Also, an advantage to you is that I can get back the um, uh, projects to you sooner than if I had to, let's say, wait until the next class period to hand back a paper copy of your project. Uh, but since then, some of these projects will be long, it's a very important that you uh, produce them in a professional manner, that you have everything nicely organized. Uh, if it's not, I will return it to you. Let's say redo it. Uh, for projects, uh, I do recommend that you complete them in groups, uh, groups of up to three people. So. You're not required to do that, but 
uh, I do recommend that, so you might start thinking about who you want to work with. Uh, if you come into this class without really knowing anybody, I will actually pass around a sheet uh, later in the semester, or in a few weeks, uh, that will allow you to sign up your group and also say, hey, I don't have a group, could you put me in a group? So uh, that, is a, that is a possibility if you're not, um, if you don't know other people in this class. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, uh, group work is great in that you can not just learn from me, but you can also learn from your fellow group members. That's why I like to um, have group work. But of course, there's always the possibility that you might not um, use group work in the right way, meaning let's say if you have a group of three, one person does all the work, and the other two people just sign their name, uh, or I guess type their name, let's say, on, on the project right before you turn it in versus actually being involved with it. So because of that, I do put this little part right here where uh, you know, you're expected to participate equally in these groups. And if I find that you're not, I will lower your grade. Okay? I have done that before. Statistical software. Uh, as I kind of mentioned earlier, we will be using R for this course. This is the number one statistical software used in academics now. Um, it's used in a variety of places uh, in industry as well. Um, interestingly, I um, attended a, a big stat conference a few weeks ago, and um, there was someone from the FDA who was uh, talking about how they use R at the FDA to evaluate new drug applications given by companies. Well, these new drug applications are typically, uh, the SAT part is usually done in SATs, but the FDA uh, evaluates the new drug applications using R at, at, a lot. So I, I always I find that interesting. But um, uh, if you're not familiar with R, don't worry about that. That's not a prerequisite for the course. We will start with the uh, introduction to R very shortly. Uh, but you are required to do everything using R. Um, one of the reasons why R has become so popular since it was first released in, in, uh, about 13 years ago is that it is free. So there is a website there that you can download it. That's the Windows version. They have Mac versions. They have Linux versions as well that are free. Uh, and again, we'll talk more about R coming up. Also, I briefly mentioned that, uh, that we are recording our lecture here. Uh, I will try to record all of our classes uh, that we have during the semester, and um, what basically happens is, obviously at the end of class, I'll hit stop on my, on my um, recording software here, uh, go back to my office, I'll click on a few, few things on my computer, and that will upload then about, uh, I think it's about 250 meg file to a web server that is on city campus. This web server is going to do some post-processing to it, and it will take maybe a couple hours for this post-processing to be done, and uh, then uh, basically a link to the video will be sent to me, and I'll post it to my course website. So by 5 p.m., typically every Monday and Wednesday, you should have available to you a link of, the, of, of, the, um, of our class that we have. Um, now, the reason why I record these classes is because, uh, you know, when you're here, you know, you might miss something that I I said, uh, hopefully it wasn't because you were sleeping, uh, but you might miss something that I said, or maybe you just didn't understand something that I, um, that I went over. And this gives you an opportunity to review it and hopefully understand it a second time around. And there might be a few times, very few times this semester when you're unable to attend. Well, here's a recording of what we did during, during class. But please don't abuse the fact that these recordings are out there by deciding that you're not going to come to class anymore. It's very easy for me to stop doing the recording. Okay. Final exam. Uh, it's Tuesday, December 17th at 10 a.m. in this class. That is the final exam time. So if you've already booked a plane ticket to go someplace, af well, after the semester is over, and if it was booked for prior than Tuesday, well, you need to change that plane flight. Okay. Also, just double check that I did actually get that time right, I'm pretty sure, uh, but I could have misread it on the web, so just double check that I did get that final exam day right. So how to be successful in this course? Um, well, understand all the material in the course lecture notes. 
Uh, I have typed lecture notes, or I will have typed lecture notes, corresponding to all the stuff that we do here. Uh, the stuff that's in there and also that we discuss in class, you need to understand all of it. Maybe, maybe that's obvious, but I just want to make sure that, that is clear. Um, of course, there may be times where I say, well, don't worry about that. Well, then don't worry about that. But typically, everything in there uh, you need to understand. This is an applied stat course. So there will be a heavy emphasis on how to do these computations that we're going to need to know how to do using R. So that's going to be a very, very important part of the course that you understand how to do all the stuff that we do in R. Uh, also, uh, we will have lots and lots of examples in this class. Make sure that you understand all components of the examples and that you could actually reproduce them, say, on a test if needed. Uh, if needed, review the class recordings, and then, of course, ask questions if you may have them. Um, finally, there's a UNL Americans with Disabilities Act statement that I am required to put on the syllabus. Are there any questions? Okay. Is it hot in here? Okay. I guess maybe I'm just feeling it's hot because I'm up here um, teaching for the first time since May. Anyway. Uh, let's see, what's next? Oh yeah, okay. Let's talk about what we're going to discuss in this course. Uh, this is not in a handout that I will give you uh, today, so if you want, you can take notes or you can just sit back, relax, and observe. Uh, so this is a, a multivariate course. Uh, I guess there's actually four, four words in the name. Apply multivariate statistical analysis. I'm just going to call it multivariate. That's what typically most people do. Well, what is multi? What does multivariate mean? Well, it just means that we have multivariate data, meaning that you might have, let's say, ten variables, ten variables, twenty variables, hundred variables, um, and you have corresponding data to them, and you're trying to make sense of them, sense of this data. That's what we do in this course. Okay. Now, the course is going to be broken up into four parts. Uh, the first part I call background material. This is stuff essentially that I would have liked you to have before you got here today. And we will start off with about one and a half classes of talking about what is R, um, how to use R. In fact, if you've had me for a class before, I know a number of you have had, this is typically how I start off most of my classes with an introduction to R. This will be the same lecture. Sorry about that. Um, then we're going to have a class on matrix algebra. Okay, So this is what I was talking about before that even though it's not a prerequisite, this is an extremely important part of the course. So we're going to spend a whole day talking about matrix algebra. Um, you know, about half of you in this class are stat majors. And I know that if you're a stat major, you've actually had a formal class on matrix algebra. The other half is not stat majors, and some of you have had matrix algebra a whole semester of it, or used it a lot in various situations that you're comfortable with it. But I know a number of you probably have not, based upon my prior experience uh, teaching this course. And so I anticipate there's probably about oh, one-fourth to a third of you who may be a little bit uncomfortable with matrix algebra. So hopefully this day that we spend on it will help you out. Um, let's see. Then we're going to talk about um, uh, basically how to summarize. Uh, I don't want to say that. We're going to uh, talk about summary statistics with respect to matrix algebra, such as how do I estimate a mean for, let's say, 10 variables? How do I estimate a covariance matrix for 10 variables? We'll talk about then, for example, a multivariate normal distribution. All of you have definitely have talked about a normal distribution. Hopefully most of you have talked about a multivariate normal distribution before. Well, if not, then this will uh, give you some background to what it is. <coughs> then once we do this, this will take maybe just six classes. We will have a test. This is that test number one that you saw in the syllabus that's worth 5% of your grade. 
I purposely made it low stakes because, well, first of all, this is stuff that you typically you should have had before coming in here. Um, but if you haven't, here's your opportunity to make sure that you understand this material. Um, and if you find out that, wait a second, some of this stuff, maybe some of this matrix algebra stuff is a little bit more difficult than I anticipated, this will be an opportunity for you if you want to either take corrective and action in terms of start trying to figure out the stuff on your own or simply to drop the class. So you don't find out halfway through the semester that, okay, this matrix algebra stuff is too difficult or maybe some of this other stuff is too difficult. I can't do it without being better prepared. So that's why I decided to, to do it this way uh, uh, when I taught the course. Uh, in the past, I actually had, had not done that, uh, but I thought this was good based upon my prior experience. Okay, so that's section one. In section two, then we get into really uh, what I would say is definitely new, new material. We're going to talk about various graphical means to summarize multivariate data. Now, you might be thinking, well, Jesus, I can do a plot. I know how to plot something on x-axis, y-axis. Well, yeah, good. But what happens if you have 10 variables? Do you know how to plot something in 10 dimensions? 20 variables, 20 dimensions. Well, we're going to talk about various multivariate plotting techniques, such as uh, something called a principal, co uh, principal coordinate plot. Uh, we'll talk about what are called trellis plots. We'll talk about star plots and other various ways that you can summarize multivariate data so that you can try to make sense of it. So we'll have a section on graphics. Uh, we will have a section on something called principal component analysis. I'm going to just abbreviate it with PCA. What this does, again, is you're trying to make sense of multivariate data. And so the way that this does is by taking linear combinations of your variables of interest to form new variables, which are called principal components. And the hope is, is that maybe these new variables that you form, maybe just a few of them are needed to make sense of 10, 20, 30 variables that you may have. So it's a way to, let's say, reduce the dimension of your data in a way where you hopefully don't lose information. And then there's going to be something called factor analysis, which I will abbreviate with FA. And this has a somewhat similar goals as PCA. Uh, but it goes about it in a, in a, in a different way can, and can actually lead to multiple interpretations as well. And then lastly, for this section, we're going to talk about cluster analysis. Where what cluster analysis does, it says, so I have, you know, this multivariate data. I might have, let's say, 20 variables associated with it. I want to somehow group these observations in a way that makes sense. You know, maybe these observations that we have in our data set uh, can be grouped into three groups or three clusters. That might be meaningful for a particular problem of, of interest. And um, so we're going to look at something called cluster analysis that allows us to do that. Once we get done with that, or I don't know, we'll see if hopefully we'll get through all of that, we'll take a test over this, let's say, section two material. Then section three, um, the purpose here is to predict classifications of your data where, let's say, the classifications were known beforehand. Let me give you an example. So when I was a, a student, I had an uh, internship out at the Idaho National Laboratory, so the Department of, Engin in Department of Energy Laboratory run by the government. And one of the projects I was working on was to figure out uh, statistical methods that could be used to um, um, basically classify unexploded artillery shells with, uh, in terms of what was inside these artillery shells. Was there maybe some kind of gap, poisonous gas? Maybe they were empty. Maybe they contained something else. And so I was working with some engineers, and they would somehow take some readings on these unexploded artillery shells without touching the artillery shells important. Um, and uh, based upon these readings, I got lots and lots and lots of variables. And I needed to try to come up with a way to determine, well, did this have gas? Was it empty? Was it maybe sand filled? Or was it something else? Now, the key is that 
we knew beforehand what was inside these shells. Given that information, and then I used some statistical methods to try to figure, figure out then what was in the shell so that, let's say, on the actual battlefield, when you might not, when you encounter artillery shell that you don't know what's inside of it, you can apply these engineering, these statistical methods then to figure out what was inside of it. So, to do this, we're going to talk about something called linear and also quadratic normal discriminant analysis. Now you notice the word normal is in there. That is with respect to we're going to have to use a multivariate normal distribution assumption with these methods. So you might be thinking, well, wait a second. What happens if a multivariate normal, as in what you've encountered in other classes, a univariate normal, let's say, does not work? Well, then there's other methods that we can use, such as one called nearest neighbor uh, discriminant analysis. Um, and uh, this then gets away from using any kind of distributional assumptions. Uh, if you've uh, talked about non-parametric regression before, uh, in particular, like, for example, low-S methods, this is the same concept of nearest neighbors as in uh, low-S methods. We will also talk about logistic and multinomial regression. If you've had me for STAT 875, our categorical data analysis course, which some of you have had me for, uh, we've talked about these models. But we're going to be using these kinds of regression models in a different way than what you would have learned in my, my 875 class. We're, what we're going to do here is try to predict the classification. Don't worry if you haven't had logistic and multinomial regression. That's okay. I will assume that you have not. Um, and then depending upon if there's time, we might discuss some other classification methods that are out there as well. And then lastly, uh, we're going to talk about some classical, classical methods. For a multivariate course. Uh, this encompasses, for example, something called Hotelling's T-squared. Um, basically what this is, is uh, the multivariate extension to a t-test. So instead of testing, for example, is mu1 equal to mu2, imagine mu1 to actually be, if you've heard of vectors before, to be a vector of means. If you haven't heard of vectors before, think of, let's say you're testing five means, are they equal to another five means, for example. We'll also talk about something called multivariate analysis of variance, MANOVA, which is the multivariate extension to ANOVA that you should have seen in a, um, uh, in a study of one like course. So that gives you an idea of what we will be doing this semester. Uh, overall, this is the sixth time that I've taught this course, uh, and this is the first time I haven't used this book by Dallas Johnson. So because of that, I am making some changes to how I've taught the course based on, again, my previous experience, but also the fact that things change over time, that there's you know, been various advances in multivariate methods since I last taught this course, and I like to start incorporating some of those into this course. Okay, are there any questions? Yeah? So where did the test three and test four? Oh, I'm sorry. Test right there. And then we'll get to the final exam. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes? We have a chance to use our own data. I have not decided yet. Um, I've, I've done both in the past in this course, um, and um, you know, one, uh, you know, obviously it's, it's, it's great to be able to use your own data, um, but the problem is we have, I think, 28 students registered for this course, and if I have 28 data sets, or even if, obviously, there would be less if we have groups, um, I've run into problems where it just, it's, it's just too much for me to, to do the grading. Because I, I do, I have to do all my grading. I don't have TAs uh, to help me with this. Yes. 
Yep. Yep. Other questions? Okay. Uh, let's see. Now, next on the agenda is let's take a look at the course website real briefly. So, again, you can go to crispler.com and access it, or you can actually type crispler.com slash multivariate to get there as well. Um, so here's just the um, home page. And you can see that basically there's uh, four other main web pages, so it's very small. If I click on section materials, this takes us to then where I will post the corresponding lecture notes to our class. Anything that I do in R, there will be a corresponding R program associated with it. You'll be able to download it from this web, uh, web page. Various data sets that we will be looking at, you can download it from this web page as well. So, for example, this is day number one. Uh, we've already seen where my office was. Here's the syllabus. We'll talk about this listserv, listserv help shortly. If I come down here to section one, background materials I had described to you before, you can see that over the summer I basically put together um, uh, all the uh, corresponding lecture notes corresponding to this background uh, material. Um, again, since this is a, I haven't taught the course since 2005, I'm basically having to rewrite all my lecture notes. Um, and I am in the process right now of doing Section 2's graphics uh, stuff. Um, you will also see here something called homework. look at it. have one of these. Now homework, at least in the context of my class, are it just contains extra problems for you to work on that are not graded in any way. So I guess you don't have to do them, but I do recommend that you do do them uh, so you get extra practice and also uh, you may see some of these exact same problems on tests. So obviously that would make sense then to, uh, to look through them. So these are additional problems uh, for you to look at. There are partial answers available to, to them as well. If you have any questions about a particular problem, you can please feel free to ask during class or post a message to this listserv that you will see shortly. And so let's see. So there you can see the, the main sections that I've been talking about put into the context of our section materials. Uh, let's talk about the listserv. So if I click on listserv, this little uh, thing will pop up. Um, I think all of you are familiar with listservs. Uh, in fact, I know a number of you have already posted a message to the listserv. Um, sorry, no extra credit for that. Uh, let me blow this up a little bit. And just to help you see what the purpose of the listserv is here, back uh, week two of August uh, 2013, I posted a message to it that welcomed all of you to the listserv. And let me just briefly read that. Uh, so welcome to the listener. Please feel free to post messages here regarding questions on projects, tests, or other things relevant to the course. So in other words, let's say that you're working on a project and you don't understand something about the project, or maybe you need something clarified. Post a message here. Do not email it to me. Post a message here. The reason being is because if you have the question, probably somebody else in the class also has the question. And therefore, all of you can benefit from seeing than my response to it, or other students' responses. If, though, if you have a question regarding your grade, or that you are going to be absent from class, or something that's just pertaining to you, email that to me. You know, pretty much most students here don't care if you have, if you're, I've had this happen before, are throwing up, and you are really sick at home, and that you're not going to be able to come to class. Don't post that stuff to the listener. I've had some very embarrassing stuff posted to the listener by students. Um, so, just a little warning. Um, so, but if you ever are unsure about whether or not to post a message to the listener or send an email to me, ask yourself, will other students benefit? Could other students benefit from seeing your message and then a response? If other students can benefit, post it here. Of course, you can use this lister for other purposes to communicate with others in the class as well. Okay, so that's the purpose of the lister. Now, in order to make the lister useful to all of you, you need to all subscribe to the lister. So, 
You'll notice here on the right hand side there's a button or a link for subscribe. And all of you are required to do this. Uh, you don't need to do it now, do it after class. Um, and you can subscribe to it, put in your email address. Once you're subscribed to it, what that means is anytime something's posted to the listserv, you will get an email that has that posted. So how do you actually make a posting to the listserv yourself? Well, there's two different ways. One way, send an email to that address. Okay, real simple. Alternatively, what you can also do is use then this web interface that we have. Um, and so let me just demonstrate that. I'm going to click on post new message. And I'm just going to uh, type for a subject test message. And this is a test. If I come over here and click on send, it will now be posted to the lister. And anybody who has subscribed to the lister will now get an email in their uh, their uh, inbox. So let's just see if it has been posted. Well, it hasn't actually appeared yet. What I've noticed, they've actually just recently updated this listserv. Um, and perhaps some of you who've actually tried this have noticed this too. It's taken a little bit long. It's not a simultaneous, um, uh, uh, it's not simultaneously being shown. So just be aware of that. Be patient. You know, give it a little time and it will appear. Now, in order to do this little web interface to um, uh, post a message, um, if you've never used uh, my listserv before, uh, or the listserv system um, that's available at UNL, uh, you will have to actually uh, register for it. And when you click on post new message, uh, there will be some fairly uh, self-explanatory things that, uh, that the listserv will tell you to do uh, so that you can post a message. However, though, if you still have questions, what I recommend that you do is take a look at my listserv help file there that talks about how to use the listserv. And if that's still not sufficient, well, uh, talk to me about it. Are there any questions about the listserv? Okay. So I have a graded materials web page. Eventually we'll have graded materials. Um, this is where I will post, for example, projects and then the corresponding answers uh, to the projects. Uh, test answers will appear here as well. Uh, with respect to tests, I don't think I've mentioned this yet, all your tests will be computer-based. So you will be using these computers here to do your tests. Not your own laptops, these computers here. Um, uh, basically what that's going to mean is that I'm going to give you a paper copy of the test, and you can actually write your answers on this paper copy of the, of the test, uh, but you can use then the computer in front of you to do the various computations. We'll talk more about that once we get to a, get to a test. But to help you out um, uh, to do these computer-based computer tests, I have actually constructed formula sheets. So the actual mathematical formulas that we will be talking about are listed there, along with the important R functions that we will be talking about too. And hopefully that will save you some time. These tests are going to be closed book, closed note, but you can access any of my old R programs available on my course website. Again, we'll talk more about that once we get to it. And let's look at the schedule web page. So this is a tentative schedule for what we will be doing this semester. So, for example, today, we've talked about the syllabus. We're talking about the website right now. We will have an R introduction very shortly. And... We will talk about very shortly, too, something called the day number one quiz. Next, our next class period on Wednesday, we will continue the R introduction. Now, this is the R introduction that I give at the beginning of pretty much all my classes. And as you know, I record my classes, as I told you I'm recording this one. So because of that, you can watch a video from the last time that I, well, not the last time, but the previous time that I actually did this R introduction. One reason why I'm doing this is because I know there's a number of you who've had my classes before, and it's going to be the same content. So, for our next class, 
watch the video. You are not required to come here to class. However, I will still be here. And this then will give you an opportunity to ask me questions about how to use R. I will not have any pre-prepared lecture. I'm only here to ask, answer your questions. Is that clear to everyone? Okay. Here's a link of the video. This is actually from Stat 875 when I taught the course, uh, taught that course. Uh, start at five minutes into the video. You can end at uh, one hour and um, 11 minutes into the video. If you have any problems with the video, try this alternative link. Uh, for some reason, while I was testing it out at home, I was having some problems at times. Also, this day number one quiz will be due at class time on that Wednesday. Again, we'll talk about that very shortly. Then we go have class next Monday for Labor Day. September 4th, we're going to talk about matrix algebra. Again, about two-thirds to three-fourths of you, I anticipate, are very comfortable with matrix algebra. I don't want to have to force you to learn about what is a matrix by coming to class. I don't want to force you to have to learn how to do an inverse of a matrix. For those of you who are not familiar with matrix algebra, what I did was actually on uh, last Friday, I recorded a video of a lecture on matrix algebra. Watch the video. You do not have to come to class here. I will still be here. So if you have questions, this is when you need to ask questions about matrix algebra. But again, I will not have any pre-prepared lecture. Again, the reason why I'm doing this is because this is a topic that most of you the, definitely the majority of you have experience with already. Um, this is, should be back now, background material for a class on multivariate methods. So I've prepared a video, and also, as an added benefit, we can have a question-answer session on it. So I actually get more out of it than if I was just here doing a lecture on matrix algebra. But again, you're not required to come to class that particular day. Is everyone clear about that? Okay. Even if you do have background in matrix algebra, I recommend that you at least take a quick look through my lecture notes, just to make sure you're familiar with how to do the stuff, uh, do matrix algebra computations and all. Then, our next regular class then will be in two weeks. Then we will regularly meet here. We will have a test then on September 18th over this material. Let me page down here. Test number two, I am 95% confident that it will be on October 28th. So if you were planning on being gone that day, please change your plans so that you can take the test here. Test number three, Wednesday, December 4th. Again, I'm 95% confident that it will be then. Please change your plans if you're planning on being gone that day. And then again, the final exam. Okay? So that's the schedule for the semester. Uh, you know, there might be some changes to it because, again, I'm having to rewrite all my lecture notes from when I've done this in the past, and also I'm hoping to incorporate some new material that I had not discussed in a multivariate course before. Any questions? Yes? Do you have any um, recommended readings for the textbooks that you would? Uh, like the textbooks that you posted on the I do not have specific recommended, recommended readings from those textbooks, but those textbooks will be quite clear that there's a chapter on principal components. Okay, we'll read that chapter. So it, it should be clear. But again, if you have questions, let me know. Okay, so let's talk about this day number one quiz. You know, often the first day of any class that you take, uh, you know, the professor wants to get some kind of inf get information about you, obviously your name, uh, but, you know, your background, like where you're from and stuff. So what I've done, this is one of the few times I will use Blackboard in this course, I have constructed a, a let's say, a quiz, or I guess Blackboard calls it a test, uh, to ask you this kind of information. Um, so Blackboard, 
think all of you probably have experience with that, my.uno.edu. Simply put in your username and your password and click on your multivariate link. Okay. And immediately when you go to multi, uh, your multivariate class, uh, you will see a, uh, a link for day number one quiz. You get some information here about force completion, multiple attempts. Just ignore that and click on continue. And you get into the actual day number one quiz. And so question number one basically says state your name. Question number two, state your email address. This is a tough quiz. Your major, well, what degree are you pursuing? And then some more tougher questions such as, well, what set courses have you taken? You can list courses that are in the set department here or outside of our set department. Um, have you taken a matrix algebra course? And if not, do you have any matrix algebra experience? It's an important question that will help me in how I teach the course. Uh, do you have any R experience? If so, please briefly describe your experience. Tell me where you're from. And then lastly, remember the listserv that we talked about. Log on to the listserv and subscribe to it. Also post a test message like I did. Once you've done that, actually type here, I'm done. And this question and all the other questions, if you have answers to them, you will get 100% on the day number one quiz. Okay. Simply will be worth five points. Uh, if you do it, you get five points. If you don't do it, you don't get five points. And um, it will be part then of this 25% of your grade, which encompasses projects and quizzes. Okay. So day number one quiz, it is due at beginning of class Wednesday. So please have that done. Okay, I think I got through all the introductory material. Are there any questions? Next, let's talk about what is R. So again, R is a free statistical software package. Um, the first full release came about in the year 2000. I started using it in 2001. Um, started teaching with it in 2000. Well, first full class teaching with it was in spring 2004. And uh, I grew up on SAS in my grad school. Um, but I have made the switch over to I, I made the switch over to R because um, it's a, it, it is a superior software package. Um, so again, you can download it from this website here. This is the Windows version, um, and you just simply click on this. It actually installs both a 32-bit version and a 64-bit version. Uh, for what we do in this class, 32-bit will be fine. Um, just install it. You can go with all the defaults. Um, it's not going to be that big on your computer. Uh, it's going to probably take up less than 100 megabytes. So it's not like SAS that will take gig gigabytes. Um, if you need another version of R, you can go to um, cran.r-project.org. CRAN stands for Comprehensive R Archive Network. And you can see here, here's Linux, here's Mac. Okay. We will be using version 3.0.1 in our class. All these computers um, should have been updated. Um, at least I've been told that they were updated uh, for the most current version of R. Um, after class, actually, I plan on checking that just to make sure. Because I just received an email on Friday saying that they, had, they were updated. Let's talk about the basics of what R is and how to use it. 
So I'm going to get into R here. Um, and what you see is one window is open. This is the R console window. This is where you can type commands to use R. At the very bottom, you see a command prompt. At this command prompt, you can type simple mathematical operations, such as 2 plus 2. And what do you know it got it right for? Uh, let's say 2 times 3 gets 6. Uh, but you can do a little bit more complicated things, such as if you want to take the natural log of the number 1, log 1. If I want to find, let's say, a quantile for my standard normal distribution, I can type Q norm 0 0.975, and I get, what do you know, 1.96 back. Okay? So what I just did here using log Q norm, those are what are called functions in R's terminology. I use the Q norm function to find a quantile for a normal distribution. Uh, as another example, suppose I type P norm 1.96 probability normal distribution, I get 0.975 back. And again, this is for a standard normal distribution. You can change that, and I'll show you how to do that a little bit later. Is this big enough for everyone? Does anyone need to, need to make it bigger? Okay, science means everything's okay. Um, now, there's going to be times where instead of having, let's say, the result immediately come back to you like this, you would like to be able to save the results so that maybe you could use it later. So what I can do in R is create what's called an object to save the result in. And I'm simply going to, for the lack of a better name, create an object called save. Okay. Save, and then I'm going to do uh, less than dash 2 plus 2. Notice how that less than dash kind of looks like a, a left arrow. What that's basically saying is put that 2 plus 2 result into something called save. So if I hit enter, look what happens. You don't see the number come back. Why? Because it is stored in save. So again, save is called an object in R's terminology. This less than dash here is what's called making an assignment. I assign 2 plus 2, that result, to save. The way, if you wanted to, let's say, verbalize this line of code that you see here, the way that this is verbalized is as follows. Save gets 2 plus 2. So that less than dash is often said as the word gets, G-E-T-S. So save gets 2 plus 2. Now, where, where does this thing called save exist? Well, it's actually in your computer's memory. If you want to see a listing of all the objects that you have saved to your computer's memory, you can do it one of two different ways. LS, parentheses, M, parentheses, that stands for basically give me a list of what's, what's in there. Or you can type objects, parentheses, M, parentheses, and you can see save is located in there as well. I might be wondering, why do I need, why do I need the parentheses? Well, this is just part of the standard syntax of working with a function. So if you notice here with QNorm, how I had a parenthesis, and then I had an argument inside of it, or an option for that terminology instead. It's actually called argument, R's terminology. I have an argument inside of it, and in this particular case, when I have LS objects, I didn't need any arguments. Okay. So it takes us then to page three. And I, also, before I forget, I want to uh, mention something. Um, so first of all, you'll notice that I have basically uh, four pages per sheet of paper here, four pages of lecture per sheet of paper. The reason why I do that is because I use a size 20 font uh, for my normal text. Uh, the reason being is because it will make it then big enough, no matter what room I'm in, it will make it big enough for you to see on a, on a projection screen. So when you actually print off my lecture notes, I recommend that you do four pages per sheet of paper. Some people prefer two. If you want to do that, that's okay. Uh, but I, I, I usually do four. Um, and uh, so, also, sorry to be backtracking here. Go back to the course website, section materials. Um, these notes that I gave you are basically in this notes file right here. Now, I only copied up until page 26 
in these notes. There are more pages in that notes file, and these additional pages are what I anticipate that uh, um, you will do then uh, for the next class. So I only only did some of the uh, some of the notes here. Okay. Now, as I mentioned, there are these things in R called functions, and they do various computations for you. Now, you can actually write your own function, uh, you know, depending upon what your needs are. So let's say that I want to write a function that calculates a standard deviation. I already know the formula for it. Um, so why don't we actually write a function that actually calculates it? There's already a function R called SD that calculates the standard deviation, but let's say that there wasn't, and we needed to to write our own. So to do this, then, first of all, I need to um, uh, get some data for which I want to calculate a standard deviation of. So I'm going to create an object called x, and it's going to get the results from using the c function, which basically means let's just combine, in this case, the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So my data set simply has five numbers in it, and it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. c means combine these numbers together. So I hit enter, and so if I type x again, there's my data. Let's write then this function. I'm going to call my function sd2, which is already an sd function, and it's going to get the results from the following. I'm going to create a function, and in this function, I need a way to pass information into it, such as my data, so that I can do my computations. And I need to give a name for whatever I'm going to pass into it. And for lack of a better name, I'm going to uh, say numbers. So if you're familiar with programming languages like a C, Fortran, or other languages like that, where you actually create procedures or functions, it's the same kind of concept where you pass in information into it. I'm going to use a a uh, uh, left bracket there to say, now are, I'm going to write the contents of my main function. Notice when I hit enter, I have a plus sign that comes back saying, okay, I need more, I need more. That's what R is trying to tell you. So there's a variety of different ways that you can calculate a standard deviation. And, uh, I'm going to use a simple way, the square root of the variance. Okay, so I'm going to use the SQRT function for square root parentheses, the var function for variance, parentheses, what I want to calculate the variance of, I things that are in numbers, and parentheses, and parentheses. So I'm taking the square root of the results from variance. Hit enter, and notice the plus sign comes back saying, okay, I need the next line of code. Well, that's all I needed to calculate a standard deviation, so let's do a right bracket, hit enter, and now I'm back to a normal prompt. If I want to actually look at this function, this function is actually an object. There it is. I can type objects and see the stuff in there. So let's actually try using this function. So if I type sd2 and then x, so what's in x is going to be passed into my function. It's going to go into wherever, what, what numbers it's called. And then the computations are done, and there's my standard deviation. Just to verify, let me just use the regular SD function itself, and what do you know? It's the exact same thing. Any questions? Yeah? Can you unwittingly name something, like a function that already exists? Yeah, you can. And what will happen is, is that um, uh, your name will take precedence. So one thing, so that's one thing you have to be careful about. So for example, uh, you know, let's say pi, you know, the, the, the mathematical number pi. I can maybe create a function called pi, and that will be, how about if I just create an actual object? Suppose I just say pi is going to be 3. So now when I type pi, so obviously you have to be careful about that. Um, I, I, I don't anticipate too many problems. So. The functions are saved for as long as this session is open. So if I close it, everything disappears. There are ways that you can save it, but typically what we will do is actually write a, a computer program. 
and we will have this code for this function in that program. We'll run it, and then we'll use the function as needed. Okay, let's do a little bit more of a complicated uh, uh, function. This is on page four. I'm going to add one line of code to my function. Or let's say maybe I want to print my data first before actually I do my computations. The way I could print my data, or one way I should say, is to use the cat function in R. And I can say, quote, print the data. Then you see a slash N there. That's just a, um, it's often referred to as an escape character, which says, go down to the next line and continue printing. And what's it going to print? It's going to print numbers. What's in numbers? Then I go ahead and calculate the standard deviation once again. Yeah, let, let me, um, just a second. So I'm going to copy that over. I guess this version, I have an extra slash in there that, again, goes down one line. Um, let's actually try it out, see what happens. So you can say, see, it says print the data, one, two, three, four, five. Notice how it went down a line, and then we have the standard deviation printed as well. Let's say instead I, I wanted to save the results. So I'm going to save the results from SD2. Um, notice I still have my printing there, but you no longer see that standard deviation. Why? Because the standard deviation is in save. Well, how does R know to put the standard deviation to save and maybe not also put this information as well. Here's the reason. The very last line of code in a function is what's automatically going to be returned to the user, no matter if you ask to be printed or not. And so if that information is going to be returned to the user, if you instead put it into an object, it goes into an object. So again, the very last line of code in a function is what's returned to the user automatically. That's one of the more difficult things to learn today. Uh, we will be looking at writing other functions this semester. Not a whole lot, but we will be working at looking at writing other functions this semester. The reason why I want to bring this up now is because we will be using lots and lots and lots of functions that have already been written in R, and you have to know the basics of how they work. Okay. So now you're probably wondering. Now you're probably wondering. Help. I don't understand this. Well, what should you do? Well, you can ask me questions, but also you can use the help that is available to you in R. There's a variety of different ways that you can get to the help. One way is to click on help, HTML help, and up will pop up a web browser that allows you to access, you can say, the help system. In particular, one thing that might be useful to you is that they have a nice little manual on how to use R. This is just a simple link to a PDF file, um, and that might be helpful if you're new to R. Uh, what we're going to be taking a look at is this reference part of help. In particular, they have a search engine where you can type in like words like standard deviation, and we'll uh, search then, well, what's the function to calculate a standard deviation? Or instead, we can look at packages. Let's do that. So for those of you who may be familiar with SAS, you know that SAS has different components to it, like SAS Graph, SAS Stat, SAS Base, SAS OR, SAS Graph. I didn't already say that. Um, and, and so in other words, SAS is broken up into different parts or components. R is also broken up into different parts or components. These components are called packages. There are over, I think now, 4,800 packages out there. Only a few of them are installed by default on your computer when you install R for the first time. Um, but one of the reasons why R has become so dominant in terms of its, its use is that uh, users can write their own package, upload it to the comprehensive R archive network that we looked at earlier, or CRAN, and so that other users can then download it for their own use. So a typical way that people do statistical research nowadays is that they'll write a paper, and they'll also have a corresponding um, they'll also have a corresponding package that actually implements the research with it. And so it really helps disseminate research. Okay, 
So these are the packages that are installed on my computer. Uh, there's a lot more packages here listed than we'll, what will be installed on your computer if you've never installed R before. And I want to come down to, well, let me just show you a few of them here. So there's one called graphics, which does basic graphs. Uh, there's one called uh, base, which is the very basic functions that allow you to do stuff in R. But we're going to talk about one called stats. So let's take a look at stats. And let's say that I want to find the help for that P norm or that Q norm function that we looked at earlier. So let's see, which one do I do here? P norm. So I'm going to click on P for P norm. And you see a list of all bunch of functions that start with the letter P. Page down to P norm. And this takes you then to the help page for this particular function. Notice it also lists a few other functions in there dealing with the normal distribution because they're very similar. So in particular, we saw this P norm here, or we see this P norm here. Notice it has P norm parentheses, and this is the actual syntax for the function, or how to use it. You see something called Q. Q stands for font tile. So before, when we were using it, we said P norm uh, 1.96. 1.96 was the 0.975 quantile from a standard normal distribution. That Q could also be incorporated into how you use the function. So instead, what I could have done was say P norm Q equal 1.96 and get back the same thing. Okay, now we also have some other, what are called arguments. You can think of them as options, but the actual formal name is arguments. One for mean equals zero, SD equal one. So these are arguments that actually have default values listed after them. Since mean equals zero, standard deviation is equal to one, that corresponds to a standard normal. So, for example, if I did mean equals zero, SD equal 1, of course I get back exactly the same thing. If you want to, you can actually remove those argument names and get the same thing too. Just you have to be very careful when you do that. You need to make sure that you're using the exact same order for what you're putting in the side of the parentheses here. You have to use the exact same order as you see in the help file. So, for example, if I did if I did this, obviously I get back a different result because R doesn't know you want 1.96 to be that quantile. So, you got to be very careful about that. That's why I recommend that you always, always use then the um, uh, the uh, the argument name there. Um, in particular. Perhaps this will make a little bit more sense. Notice how I can change the order of the arguments, as long as I give their names. Um, also in this help file here, so you see a list of the arguments, a description. You see some details of what this function does, or these functions do. Um, and at the very bottom here, you see some actual examples. So you can actually copy and paste these examples um, into your R and run it to see what happens. So it's a great way to learn then what, this, what these functions or how to use these functions. Um, so that's one way then to access help. Another way to access help is that you can simply type at a console prompt, a console prompt, help parentheses, the function of interest. And that will pop up then that same exact help file that we saw before. So that's just another way to do it. Are there any questions? Well, one of the strengths of, of using R is that it can be used to, um, uh, or its functions are, uh, can be um, use on vectors of information. What I mean by vectors, if you're not familiar with it, you can think of it as, let's say, uh, sets of information that are put together. So for example, we've already seen one vector, that x. 
In our terminology, this is called a vector. Um, and so, in particular here, if I type P norm, Q equal, I'm going to combine negative 1.96 and positive 1.96 together, you can see how I get two probabilities back. Otherwise, if that wasn't possible, I would have to use two P norm functions to get then these two quantities. Here, I only need to use one call to the function to get the necessary quantities. So it's a very nice aspect then of, 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 of using R is its ability to work on vectors of information. Um, another example, suppose I use the QT function. What do you think QT stands for? Yeah, quantality distribution. So if I said quant, uh, QT P equal, oh, uh, let's see, let's say, uh, let's combine uh, 0 0.025, 0 0.975, and then, of course, with the T distribution, you need to worry about degrees of freedom. So there happens to be an argument, so this is in the help, called DF. So I say DF, oh, let's do 9, and then I get two quantiles back. There's no need to use statistical tables anymore. Hopefully, uh, your past professors have not made you use statistical tables. Just simply type in stuff like this in R. Let's look at a little bit more of a complicated example of, of, um, of, of uh, using vectors of information. Let's say I have a data set that has 10 data values in it, and I want to find a confidence interval for me. Okay. My data is going to be stored in X again, so I'm just going to copy and paste this over. There's X, sample size of 10, and I would like to find <coughs> a confidence interval for population mean with this. So, first of all, I'm going to need a sample mean. So, as you might expect, there's a function called mean, and there's my sample mean. Um, let's just uh, actually also review the actual formula for a confidence interval for mean. Hopefully, this looks familiar. Let's say that I call my sample mean x bar. I need to take plus or minus a 1 minus alpha divided by 2 quantile from a t distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom, times then the standard deviation, let's call it s, divided by the square root of my sample size, let's call it n. Um, that should look very familiar to you. Basically, what I need to do now is base, uh, program this into R. Okay, we've already seen how to do the quantile. We've already seen how to do the standard deviation. Well, how do I find my sample size? Well, I could just simply type in 10, or instead what I could do, to be a little bit more general, use the length function. The length of x is 10. So let's start putting some of this stuff together. So I'm going to uh, first look at my quantile from my t distribution. I'm going to take it times my standard deviation, divided by square root of my sample size. And if I hit enter, look what happens. I get two things back. Now obviously the standard deviation is one number. The square root of my sample size is one number. But I have two quantiles. So how did R react? Well simply what it did was it took the first quantile times the standard deviation divided by square root of n, and then it took the second quantile times the standard deviation divided by square root of n. So notice how it did what you kind of would want it to do. You disagree? No, no. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but of course, you know, you got to be careful in these kinds of situations, and you know, just, you know, you could do some simple checks to make sure that that actually did work. Next, so now I have these two numbers there, and I want to add the mean to it. And what do you know? The mean is added to the first number, and then it's added to the second. And there's my confidence interval for a population mean. You can check your answer by using the t.test function. I'll let you look at that on page 9. Um, and indeed, we get exactly the same answer. Okay. So, unfortunately, we are out of time. We didn't get as far as I wanted to. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to post to my course website a, um, uh, a video 
of me uh, finishing up the lecture over these notes. And then that will then take you to, let's go back to my course website. That will take you then to the spot where this lecture here starts. Okay? So, just give me a little time. Don't immediately go back to your office or your home right now and immediately start looking at this lecture because it might not make sense because there was some, so some stuff that we need to discuss that unfortunately we didn't get to. Okay, are there any questions? Yes? Um, I can that is fine. Our studio is going to be on the, uh, is, is on these computers. Um, and in fact, the stuff that I wanted to talk about today was how to use our studio. Uh, so you're foreshadowing what everyone else is going to see shortly. Uh, I use our studio and also I use a, a, a package called TIN to do my programming. So both are fine. Okay, that's it for today.